Okay, so we'll start the webinar now. Hi guys, good evening to all. Welcome you all in this emerging technology webinar on self-learning automation of machine learning pipeline using autonomous analytics. Uh, Chaitali here, your host for this webinar. I will be there to help you out if you need any help. Uh, chat box is open to all. If you have any queries, question, you can put it over there. The speaker will take the questions from there. Now talking about the event sponsor, Synergetics. So Synergetics Learning is India's most distinguished learning company in IT technology. Uh, we are ready with our top class learning solutions that can be made to fit in every requirement in every sector across every industry around the globe. Uh, our expansive Greenfleet solutions include persona based onboarding. Then we have onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution. So the webinar which we are conducting today comes under emerging technology training solution. Then we have certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution, practice playbook solution and architecting solution. Then the today's webinar is organized by ETC community that is emerging technology community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. Our ETC community is open to all the people who are interested in emerging technologies. You just need to install the Meetup app on your phone or on your device to, to follow this community. The link for this community will be provided to you all in the chat box later on. Then code of conduct. Please note that no one is allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation and cannot do the screen. Also, if you have any technical question related to the topic, you can use the chat box to ask your question. After this webinar, if anyone needs the recording, simply subscribe to our YouTube channel. Your channel link will be posted in the chat box for you. We have Smith for this webinar. He's an MCD, Microsoft Certified Trainer and currently works with Synergetics as an trainer consultant. Then agenda for this webinar, you will get an overview of this topic and more. Then do follow us on our social platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do provide updates on the relevant upcoming webinars which we do related to the search as well as the emerging technology. So make sure you follow us over on all the search on the social media platforms. I will post the links for the social media platforms in the chat box. Uh, now I would like to hand over the mic to the speaker so he can go ahead with the webinar. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session. Before we go ahead, uh, just let me know in the chat box whether you can see my screen clearly and my voice is perfectly audible to you. Just give me a confirmation in the chat so we can proceed ahead. Yes, OK, thanks, all of you. Fine, so let's go ahead. Before going ahead, just a brief intro of myself. My name is Smith Shah, and I will be your mentor for today. I'm Microsoft Certified Trainer, and I started my a journey in the IT field with Accenture as a software developer. After that, I moved into the field of data science and I've been working in the field of data science in the past four years. And I've been associated with 12 different institutes, including Upgrad, Board Infinity, Virgil, Inmovidu, and many more. Right now, I'm associated with Synergetics as their data science consultant. So that's all about me. Now let's go ahead and let's look at the agenda for today. So guys, today we'll be doing three main things. First, we'll be covering the basics of machine learning. So if any of you guys don't know anything about machine learning, no issues. We'll be starting from absolute basics. 
after that the second main thing that we will do is we'll implement one machine learning algorithm using a popular library called sklearn but that library called sklearn is not that ideal for implementing machine learning it was ideal many many years back but right now it is outdated so which is why we'll move on to our third main thing for this webinar which is that we'll implement the same machine learning algorithm using a new library called pycaret with help of pycaret you will do all the things that sklearn was allowing us to do it's just that pycaret allows us to make the implementation a lot more easier it allows us to implement it in a much more easier manner a lot of the steps that will perform in pycaret uh, you will feel that it's almost automated okay in sklearn you had to write a lot of lines of code with pycaret just by writing few lines of code you will be implementing the same exact things fine so we'll be covering three main things as i discussed first is basics of machine learning second will implement one machine learning algorithm using sklearn library third will implement the same machine learning algorithm using pycaret library all right so these are the three main things that we'll be doing for today so let's go ahead and let's start by doing the first main thing which is understanding the basics of machine learning so let's go ahead and let's cover the basics so what is machine learning in simple words machine learning is just a set of tools which is used for two purposes first is to get inferences from the data second is to get predictions from the data now what do i mean by inference inference means insights i repeat inference means insights from data so for example let's say i have data of a very popular store called dmart and looking at that data i am coming to the conclusion that in evening more people are coming into dmart as as supposed to let's say in the afternoon so i would recommend my manager to make sure that the preparations are all right in the evening i'll recommend my manager to make sure that uh, the security is on point at the evening and lots more so looking at the data i am arriving at this one simple insight like this you can arrive at many such insights okay so machine learning is that of tools used for two things first is inferences which means insights second is predictions so if i want to predict something about the future let's say i have data of weather and looking at how it has rained in the previous years i want to predict how it will rain in the upcoming year so that is predictions so if anybody asks you what is machine learning you will say that machine learning is just a set of tools which is used for two purposes first is to get inferences from the data second is to get predictions from the data all right now how does it do that how does machine learning get inferences and predictions from data it does that by using something called a machine learning model okay what is a machine learning model a machine learning model is just a statistical representation of a real world process in simple words you are trying to use statistics to simulate what would happen in the real world let's understand this definition better suppose i have data of some houses in my vicinity let's say i have surveyed three houses and i have their information so i have information about the square feet of the house and the price of the house now the first house that i surveyed had a square feet of 100 square feet and the price was let's say 1 crore the second house that i surveyed had a square feet of 200 square feet and the price was 2 crore and the third house that i surveyed had a square feet of 300 square feet and the price was 3 crore now if anybody asks us that okay in my vicinity there is another house whose square feet is 400 square feet now can anybody tell me the estimated price of this house aditya can you tell me the estimated price of this house looking at the trend that is being shown in the data can you estimate the price of the house aditya has correctly estimated the price he says that the price of this house 
would roughly be around 4 crores right so aditya you are predicting the price of the house over here so you are basically performing prediction operation and you performed this prediction operation by doing some mathematics in your head or by doing some statistics in your head although it was very simple mathematics or very simple statistics that you performed but still you did try to perform some mathematics in your head some statistics in your head and based on that you arrived at this prediction that's exactly what machine learning model does a machine learning model also does prediction by doing some mathematical operations or by doing some statistical operations okay is this that right now in our example we did a very simple mathematical operation whereas machine learning model would be doing complex mathematical operations but the idea remains the same that what does a machine learning model do basically all it does is that to simulate a real world process it performs mathematical operations or it performs statistical operations so two things that we have learned first what is machine learning so if anybody asks us what is machine learning we will say machine learning is just a set of tools which is used for two purposes first is to get inferences from the data second is to get predictions from the data now how does it do that how does it get inferences and predictions from data it does that by using something called a machine learning model so what is a machine learning model it is a statistical representation of a real world process in simple words it tries to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics all right now a very important note which is that for any machine learning model to work we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns it does not matter how many rows how many columns we have all we require is that in order to build a machine learning model we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns now the columns of the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column what is the difference between a feature column and a target column well feature columns are those columns that help me to predict whereas target column is that column that i want to predict so suppose i have this data over here of some houses and i have information about their square feet i have information about the city in which that house is present and i also have information about the price of that house now let's say i have surveyed four houses okay and i have recorded their information over here now in this data that you see i have some columns we know that the columns in the data can be categorized into one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict so over here suppose if i want to predict price then price will be which type of column guys can anyone apart from aditya answer aditya would probably know apart from aditya can anyone else answer i will repeat the question over here in this data we can see some columns and we know that the columns in the data are of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict so if i want to predict price then price will be which type of column guys can anybody let me know in the chat if i want to predict price then price is which type of column nidhi has given the correct answer deepak has given correct answer even gurvendra has done that and you guys have correctly said that price will be my target column perfect and you guys are right if i wanted to predict on price column then price column is my target column then does city help me to predict price yes so city will be my feature column then does square feet help me to predict price yes so square feet will be my feature column so the columns in the data are of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict okay and we have understood that differentiation over here correctly just to revise the first thing that we learned is the definition of machine learning so if anybody asks you what is machine learning you will say that machine learning is just a set of tools which is used for two purposes first is to get inferences from the data 
Second is to get predictions from the data. Now, how does it do that? How does machine learning get inferences and predictions from data? It does that by using a machine learning model. What is a machine learning model? It is just a statistical representation of a real world process. In other words, it tries to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics. Then we learned a very important note, which is that for any machine learning model to work, we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Now the columns of the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. Oh, fine. Now let's go ahead. Now we need to understand that machine learning models are of many, many types. Today we will look into two of such types. Okay, because in 99% of the companies, these two types of machine learning models are implemented. Remember, machine learning models are of many, many types. Okay, we are looking into two of the most popular types. Okay, first type is called supervised machine learning model. Second type is called unsupervised machine learning model. So what is the difference between a supervised machine learning model and a unsupervised machine learning model? Well, in supervised machine learning models, the data that I'm using has features and target both. Whereas in unsupervised machine learning model, the data that I'm using only has features, but it does not have target. I repeat, in supervised machine learning model, the data that I'm using has features and target both. Whereas in unsupervised machine learning models, the data that I'm using only has features, but it does not have target. Now, Supervised machine learning models are further classified into two types. First is called classification model. Second is called regression model. What is the difference between a classification model and a regression model? Well, in case of a classification model, my target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas in case of a regression model, my target column has infinite set of possibilities. Let's understand this with the help of an example. Suppose I have a column called dice roll. Let's say I'm playing the game of dice with my friends. And when I roll the dice once, let's say I get the value three. So I've written three. Next time when I roll the dice, I get the value two. So I've written two. Next time when I roll the dice, I get the value six. So I've written six and so on. So in this column, I'm recording the output that I get after a dice roll. So I have this dice roll column over here. Now suppose that this dice roll column is your target column. Suppose that this dice roll column is your target column. Now in this dice roll column, do I have finite set of possibilities or do I have infinite set of possibilities? You guys would argue that in the dice roll column, I have only six possibilities. When I roll the dice, I have only six possibilities. Either I can get the value one or two or three, or four, or five, or six. Apart from these six possibilities, I don't have anything else. That means you are saying that in dice roll, I have finite set of possibilities. If dice roll column is my target column, and you are saying that in your target column, you have finite set of possibilities. If in your target column, you have finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification model. Okay, let's take another example. Suppose I have gender column and I'm recording the gender of every employee in my office. Let's say the first employee that I met had a gender of female. The next employee that I met had a gender of male. The next employee that I met had a gender of male and so on. So over here, I have this dice roll column. Now let's suppose dice roll column is my target column. Suppose it is your target column. Now. In this target column, do you have finite set of possibilities or do you have infinite set of possibilities? You guys would argue that in the gender column, which is my target column, you have only two possibilities, right? Male or female. So you are saying in the gender column, you have finite set of possibilities. If gender column is your target column, then you are saying in your target column, you have finite set of possibilities. And if in your target column, you have finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification model. 
let's take another example suppose i have a column like temperature and i'm recording the temperature of my city after every 30 minutes so let's say once when i recorded the temperature was 30.1 degree celsius after that it was 31.676 degree celsius and so on now over here suppose this temperature column is your target column in this target column do you have finite set of possibilities or do you have infinite set of possibilities well you guys would argue that in case of temperature i have infinite set of possibilities the temperature of the city could be 30.111 degree celsius it could be 29.676 degree celsius it could be anything so you are saying that in temperature you have infinite set of possibilities if temperature is your target column then in your target column you have infinite set of possibilities and if in your target column you have infinite set of possibilities then your model will be called a regression model all right so before we go ahead just a recap of what we have done and let me write the recap over here in our notes so that you can refer the notes later okay so over here i will just give a heading basics of machine learning and we'll just write the notes over here so let's have a short recap so the first thing that we learned is the definition of machine learning the first thing that we learned is definition of machine learning so what is machine learning can anybody else in the chat answer what is machine learning the first thing that we learned today is the definition of machine learning so what is machine learning guys can anybody in the chat answer what is machine learning anyone just to give you a hint machine learning is a set of tools used for two purposes right deepak has given the correct answer even lokesh has done that so these guys have correctly given the answer even murugeshan has done that so these guys are correct, have correctly said that machine learning is just a set of tools which is used for two purposes either to get inferences from the data or to get predictions from the data now how does it do that how does machine learning get inferences and predictions from data it does that by using something called a machine learning model so what is a machine learning model a machine learning model is just a statistical representation of a real world process i repeat a machine learning model is a statistical representation of a real world process in simple words a machine learning model tries to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics so that is the second thing that we had learned then we had learned a very important note which is that for any machine learning model to work we need some data okay so in order to make any machine learning model work we need some data having some rows and some columns so that is the third thing that we learned that in order to make any machine learning model work we need some data having some amount of rows and some amount of columns then the next thing that we learned is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict then the next thing that we learned is that the machine learning models are of many types today we looked into two types the first type of machine learning model that we covered was called supervised machine learning model the second type of machine learning model that we covered was called unsupervised machine learning model can anybody tell me the difference between supervised machine learning model and unsupervised machine learning model anyone what is the difference between supervised machine learning model and unsupervised machine learning model anybody with the difference Gurvendra has given the correct difference Gurvendra has rightly said that in case of a supervised machine learning model the data that i am using has features and target both in case of a supervised machine learning model the data that i am using has feature columns and target columns both whereas a unsupervised machine learning model only has features it does not have target column okay 
then we learn that supervised machine learning models are further divided into two types first is called classification model and second is called regression model can anybody apart from gurvendra tell me the difference between classification and regression gurvendra would probably know apart from gurvendra what is the difference between a classification model and a regression model nidhi has given the correct difference nidhi has correctly said that in case of a classification model my target column has finite set of possibilities whereas in case of a regression model my target column has infinite set of possibilities okay in case of a classification model the target column has finite set of possibilities whereas in case of a regression model the target column has infinite set of possibilities all right so these are the five main things that we covered first was the definition of machine learning we learned that machine learning is a set of tools used for two purposes either to get inferences from the data or to get predictions from the data how does it do that how does machine learning get inferences and predictions from data it does that by using something called a machine learning model so what is a machine learning model it is a statistical representation of a real world process in simple words a machine learning model tries to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics after that we learned a very important note which is that for making any machine learning model work we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns now the columns of the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict then we learned that machine learning models of of various types there are many many types of machine learning models we are just looking into two of those today first is supervised machine learning model second is unsupervised machine learning model what is the difference between the two well in case of a supervised machine learning model the data that i am using has features and target both whereas in case of a unsupervised machine learning model the data that i am using only has features but it does not have target then we learned that supervised machine learning models are further divided into two types first is classification model second is regression model what is the difference between the two well in case of a classification model the target column has finite set of possibilities whereas in case of a regression model the target column has infinite set of possibilities so these are the things that we covered under basics of machine learning so i hope basics of machine learning is clear to you guys if there are any doubts in basics of machine learning then please let me know i'll be clearing them i hope they are clear but if you have any doubts in basics of machine learning please do let me know. okay so now that basics of machine learning is done let's go ahead at any point of time if you have any doubts you can mention them in the chat and let me do one thing we had to cover three things for today first was basics of machine learning so just let me mark it over here that we have completed it it's loading fine and basics of machine learning is complete so i'll just mark it over here all right so basics of machine learning is done now let's move on to the second thing for today which is to implement one machine learning algorithm using sklearn library so first let me introduce that machine learning algorithm to you and the name of that machine learning algorithm is k nearest neighbors okay the name of that machine learning algorithm is k nearest neighbors now this machine learning algorithm is a supervised machine learning algorithm okay it is a supervised machine learning algorithm that means in order to make it work you will need feature columns as well as your target column okay so this machine learning algorithm is a supervised machine learning algorithm and within supervised it is classification or regression algorithm well it is a classification algorithm that means in order to make it work the target column in it should have only finite set of possibilities okay fine so our first machine learning algorithm that we are learning about is called 
K nearest neighbors. In short form, it is sometimes also referred to as K and N. Okay, the full form of K and N is K nearest neighbors. All right. So our first machine learning algorithm for today is K nearest neighbors. Let's see how it works. Now we know that for making any machine learning algorithm work, we need some data having some rows and some columns. So let's have that data over here. Let's suppose I have some data and in that data, I have three columns. First is experience, third is age. Uh, sorry, first is experience, second is age, third is gender. Out of the three columns, the first two columns, which are experience and age, are my feature columns. And the last column, which is gender, is my target column. Okay, so I have that data over here. This is how the data looks like. In this data, I have three columns, experience, age, and gender. Out of the three columns, experience and age are my feature columns, whereas gender is my target column. All right. So we know that in order to make any machine learning algorithm work, we need some data and we have that data over here. Fine, let's go ahead and let's see on this data. How can we implement this machine learning algorithm called K nearest neighbors? Let's see how that algorithm works. But before we make it work, I will just plot this data onto a graph so that we can understand the data better. OK, any data, if we plot it onto a graph, will be able to understand it better. So similarly, let me plot this data also onto a graph. So let me have a graph over here and I will have a graph in such a way that one feature column is on the X axis. Another feature column is on the Y axis and I will plot the points accordingly. So if I look at the first row of the data there, the age value is 21. So I plotted the point accordingly. The experience value is one. So I plotted it accordingly and the gender mentioned is male. Now, if a point has a gender value of male, I will color it as red. If it has a gender value of female, I will color it as blue. OK, so let's go ahead. So since this point had a gender value of male, I colored it in red color. Similarly, let me plot the second point for that. I will move on to the second row of the data. Similarly, the third point and for that, I'll move on to the third row of the data. And similarly, if the fourth point for that, I'll move on to the fourth row of the data. So basically, I had some data and that data I have plotted onto a graph. Nothing else. In this way, I'm able to understand the data in a better way. All right, let's go ahead. Now, why is any machine learning algorithm used? You guys had correctly mentioned. I think Gurvendra had correctly mentioned in the chat earlier that any machine learning algorithm is used for two purposes, either to make inferences from the data or to make predictions from the data. So here, let's suppose I want to make predictions. OK, let's suppose today we want to make machine learning algorithm to get predictions. So I want to predict that if in my company the age of an employee is, let's say, 22 years and the experience is one year, then what is the gender of that employee? OK. So here I want to use my machine learning algorithm for prediction purposes. Gurvendra had correctly mentioned earlier that any machine learning algorithm can only be used for two purposes. First is to get inferences from data. Second is to get predictions from data. Here I'm using it to get predictions. Fine, let's go ahead. Now remember that the first four rows had target values in them. First four rows had target values in them. Now, target values are also known as labels. Another word for target values is labels. Okay, target values are also known as labels. So I can say that the first four rows had labels present in them. So I can call them labeled rows. I can call them labeled rows. Okay, so the first four rows are my labeled rows. The last row over here, the last row does not have a target value. So the last row is unlabeled. So I will call it unlabeled row. I will call it unlabeled row. OK, so for all the labeled rows, I plotted these points, right? For all the labeled rows, I plotted these points. There were four labeled rows. So I 
plotted for labeled points. What about this unlabeled row over here? What about this unlabeled row? Well, for that unlabeled row also, I will plot a point. Is this that it will be unlabeled? Okay, so for that unlabeled row also, let me plot a point. In that unlabeled row, the age value is 22, experience value is 1. So I will plot the point accordingly. And I don't know the label of it. So I will not label it as either male or female. That means I will not color it as either red or blue. Okay, I will keep it unlabeled. So there are four total rows out of which the first four rows are labeled. So for the first four rows, I plotted these four, four labeled points. There was one row which was unlabeled. So for that unlabeled row, I plotted this one unlabeled point. Okay, so there were five rows. Out of them, four were labeled. So for those four labeled rows, I plotted four labeled points. There was one unlabeled row. So for that one unlabeled row, I plotted one unlabeled point. Fine. Basically, what I have done is I had some data and that data I have plotted onto the graph. Nothing else. Okay. I have not even started my machine learning algorithm yet. Okay. All I had was I had some data because we know for making any machine learning model work, we needed some data. And I had some data with me over here and that data I have plotted onto the graph. Nothing else. Now, let's see on this data. How can we implement a machine learning algorithm called K nearest neighbors? So what are the steps behind the algorithm? The first step is to choose number of neighbors. First step is to choose number of neighbors. So let's suppose I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. OK, let's suppose over here I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. OK, then second step. Second step is depending upon the number of neighbors, you will select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So this is my unlabeled data point. With respect to this unlabeled data point, I will select some closest labeled points. How many I will select? Well, it depends upon number of neighbors. Since in the previous step, I selected number of neighbors equal to three, that's why I will select three closest labeled points. OK, so I will select three closest labeled points with respect to this unlabeled point. So with respect to this unlabeled point, I will select three closest labeled points. So let me go ahead and do that. OK, so with respect to this unlabeled data point, I will select three closest labeled points. OK, with this I have completed step two. I repeat step one was what? Let me go back. Step one was to choose number of neighbors. Suppose I chose number of neighbors equal to three. Then second step, depending upon the number of neighbors, you will select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So I had this unlabeled data point. With respect to it, I will select some closest labeled points. How many? Well, it depends upon number of neighbors. Since I selected three number of neighbors, that's why I will have three closest labeled points. OK, and here I do have that. Then next step. Next step is to make all of the selected labeled points to vote. So I have selected three labeled points. All of these three points will vote. Red points will vote for red. Blue points will vote for blue. So if red points vote for red, blue points vote for blue, you will observe that two votes will go to red and one vote will go to blue. One vote will go to blue. And this was your third step. Third step was to make all of these selected labeled points to vote. Third step was to make all of these selected labeled points to vote. Fine. Then fourth step. Fourth step is based on the majority of the votes. You will assign a label to the unlabeled data point. So your majority of the votes have gone to red color. That's why the unlabeled data point will also be assigned a red color. Since majority of the votes have gone to red color, that's why the unlabeled data point will also be assigned a red color over here. Okay. Red color stands for gender value of male. That's why this unlabeled row now will have a gender value of male. So my machine learning algorithm is predicting that this unlabeled row will have a gender value of male. So you can see how this machine learning algorithm is working in order to do its tasks. A machine learning algorithm only does two tasks. Either it does inferences 
or it does predictions. Here we have used it to do predictions. Okay, fine. So what we have done? So guys, we just got introduced to our first machine learning algorithm called K nearest neighbors. And in order to make it work, there are some steps. To be precise, there are four steps. Now, can anybody tell me those four steps? Let's go ahead and let's make a note of them over here. So I'll just give a heading. I will just give a heading over here. I'll call it K nearest neighbors. And let's see these steps. So there are four steps. What is the first one? Can anybody tell me the first step? There are four steps in total. There are OK. Now over here, I have some uh, chats. Let me go ahead and let me read them. OK, now DK asks how statistics is important in ML. Not clear why statistics is important. OK, let's see that example again. DK over here. All right, so DK. Uh, suppose I have some data of houses. OK, let me show you the same exact example that I showed you earlier. So let's say I have some data of houses and I have information about the square feet of the house. As well as the price of the house. I have information about the square feet of the house as well as price of the house. Now let's say I've surveyed three houses in my locality. The first house that I surveyed had a square feet of 100 square feet and the price was 1 crore. Let's say the second house that I surveyed had a square feet of 200 square feet and the price was 2 crore. The third house that I surveyed had a square feet of 300 square feet and the price was 3 crore. Okay. Now, DK, if anybody asks you that the fourth house has a square feet of 400 square feet. If anybody asks you to predict the estimated price of the house, in your opinion, what will be the estimated price of the house, DK? In your opinion, buddy, DK, what is the estimated price of this house? See, DK, the first three houses that, that we surveyed, first house had a square feet of 100 square feet, price was 1 crore. Second house that we surveyed had a square feet of 200 square feet. Price was 2 crore. The third house that we surveyed had a square feet of 300 square feet. Price was 3 crore. So if anybody asks you about this fourth house, if anybody asks you that this fourth house has a square feet of 400 square feet, then DK, what do you feel is the estimated price of the house? 4 crore, right DK? So can I say DK that in your mind, in you perform this prediction operation, in order to perform this prediction operation, DK, did you use some mathematics in your head? Yes or no? In order to arrive at this prediction, do you, did you use some mathematics in your head? Yes or no, buddy? You did perform some mathematics, right? Although it was very simple, but you did perform some mathematics in your head. Agreeing or not? DK, are you there? You did perform some, yes, right? So in order to arrive at this prediction, you did perform some mathematics. In other words, you did perform some statistics. That's exactly what a machine learning algorithm will do. It's just that it will apply statistics in a much more complex manner. But in, at the end of the day, it is applying statistics only. It is applying mathematical formulas only. So just like you, DK, in order to arrive at this prediction that you gave me, you applied some mathematical formula in your head. Similarly, a machine learning algorithm will also do that. So just like in order to perform, let's say, prediction operation, you had to you had to apply mathematics uh, uh, formula. Similarly, machine learning model will also need a mathematical formula. What is mathematics? In simple words, we call mathematics statistics, basically. Okay, so just like you needed help of statistics, machine learning model will also need help of statistics. So I hope you have understood buddy the need of statistics. Okay, because without statistics, you would have not been able to give me this prediction answer. You gave me the correct prediction answer, but you gave it to me with help of statistics only. Okay, similarly, machine learning model will also need statistics. 
what mathematics or what statistics can you elaborate so dk it depends upon algorithm to algorithm okay for example uh, dk right now we are learning about one uh, machine learning algorithm called knn we have not completed it fully i will show you behind the scenes what statistics uh, formulas are working okay just in 5 minutes i will show you that in different machine learning algorithm some different statistical formulas will apply so it depends upon algorithm to algorithm okay in different algorithms different statistical formulas will apply okay so if you are talking about which statistical formulas will apply well it depends upon algorithm to algorithm here today we are talking about one such machine learning algorithm called knn and in 5 minutes i will show you what statistical formulas being are being applied okay fine and uh, not just uh, so over here rohit has mentioned some of the statistical topics uh, yes rohit we do use probability apart from probability also there are a lot more statistical uh, topics that uh, are required to implement machine learning algorithm okay yes some machine learning algorithm could just use probability as rohit has mentioned some other could use more topics other than probability okay so as rohit has mentioned correctly yes there are some machine learning algorithms that just use probability there are some machine learning algorithms that use more statistical topics apart from probability depends on algorithm to algorithm okay fine then any other doubt let me check over here okay now ashish has a uh, okay before that there was one question from aditya aditya says any example of unsupervised learning model yes so aditya for example let's say uh let's take example of a let's say uh tesla car okay let's take example of tesla car what does a tesla car do it drives automatically right so what it is doing is that it has a camera at the front and it has cameras at lot of other positions basically from those cameras it is taking pictures continuously and it is predicting whether uh, we have some obstacle at the uh, front or at the back or at the side and so on right now in order to predict this your tesla car is also predicting right so basically a tesla car is also using some machine learning model behind the scenes and it is predicting on it now for that it would need data right so it would need data it would need that okay this picture if it has something in that picture you have a mountain okay then there is some other picture in that picture you have some something else let's say you have a cat and so on and now over your aditya can i say when i give a label over your to the picture basically i am giving a target value to the picture because labels are also known as target values so i'm giving a target value that okay uh, this picture has a target value of mountain second picture has a target value of cat and so on now aditya do you think is it it is possible to give target values to crores and crores of images manually do you think it's possible is it possible aditya to give labels to crores and crores of images manually no it's not possible so what we do in such scenarios is we just give images which which act as features by the way we just give features and we do not give target values because it's not possible for us to have target values sometimes it's tedious to insert target values sometimes we don't even know what the target values are so in such scenarios what you do is you have some machine learning algorithm that works without target values okay so for example your tesla car the data given to it it's not necessary that it, uh, it has target values given to it okay so in such scenarios okay in such scenarios where it's not possible for you to give target values you just give features and there are some machine learning algorithms that just work with that okay are there any drawbacks to it yes there are drawbacks but we have such machine learning algorithms present that's all okay but yes you are correct that if we do not have target values present there would be some drawbacks to it and yes there are drawbacks and we'll talk about them ahead so you wanted one example so this is one example so many a times you will see in industry 
especially when you are working on this uh, image data, right? It's not possible to give labels or it's not possible to give target values to each of your images. So in such cases, you just pass your images and use a machine learning model that just takes your images or in other words, just takes your features and works with it. Are there any drawbacks? What are they? That will see it. But you wanted an example and this is one example of unsupervised learning model. OK, so you use it in scenarios where it's not possible for you to give target values. OK, how does it work? What are the drawbacks? That's a different topic. OK, and if you want, we'll see that ahead as well. OK, then uh, I think there was one other question Ashish had mentioned. Ashish was asking, you have mentioned that in supervised machine learning model, we have two types, classification and regression. And in uh, unsupervised machine learning model, no. In unsupervised machine learning model, buddy, we have brother of classification, which is called clustering. OK, so in unsupervised learning, we have something called clustering. OK, it's not classification. It's similar to classification, but we do not call it classification. OK, so it's called clustering. Remember that. So in unsupervised learning model, if you are saying we have classification, no. We have something similar to that. You are right. We have something similar, but it's not exactly classification. It's something similar and that is called clustering. OK, so just to give you a hint, uh, can I say Ashish in classification? Basically, we are grouping the data, right? For example, we are saying that, for example, let's say I have some data of employees and I have their age and experience and let's say gender. Let's say gender is my target column. OK, and I'm having some data over here. Let's say the first employee had a experience, had an age of 21 years. Experience was one year and the gender was male. The second employee had a experience of 22 years. Sorry, had an age of 22 years. Experience was two years and the gender was, let's say, male again. And similarly, I will have some data. OK, similarly, I will have some data over here. Let me go ahead. Let me have some data. Let me go ahead. Let me have some data. So Ashish, can I say, buddy, that in this scenario, let's say if gender is my target column, then you would observe that in this target column, you have a, you have finite set of possibilities. And if in my target column, I have finite set of possibilities, then it's called classification model. So fine, on this data, we'll be building a classification model. And can I say, Ashish, that in case of a classification model, we are grouping the Data over here, for example, we could say that first two rows are in a group of male, second two are in a group of female. So can I say classification is similar to grouping? Can I say that, Ashish? Classification is similar to grouping? Yes, it's similar, right? You are basically grouping the values that you have in your data. It's grouping, okay? Now, you had asked that in unsupervised learning model, there is something similar. Yes, it's called clustering, although it's not in our agenda for today. But since we have asked, I'm just giving you the answer that in unsupervised model, there is something similar to classification, which is called clustering. There also you do grouping. It's just that in classification, we know the number of groups and we know what the groups are. For example, I know that number of groups is two and they are male and female. In clustering, you do not know the number of groups and you do not know the name of those groups. How to implement? That's a completely different story and implementing is very simple. Uh, uh, simple. If you want later, once our agenda for today is complete, I will show you implementation also. But you wanted the difference. So I'm just giving you the difference over here, which is that in you rightly said that in supervised machine learning model, we have something called classification. Okay, which does grouping. Similarly, in unsupervised learning model, we have something called clustering, which also does grouping. So what is the difference between the two? Well, in classification, I know the number of groups and I know what the groups are. Whereas in clustering, I do not know the number of groups and I do not know what those groups are. OK, so that is the difference. Fine. I hope the difference is clear. If you want the implementation, once our agenda for today is complete, I'll show you the implementation of that as well, along with theory as well as the code. OK, but I hope the difference made sense to you. Fine. 
this is the high level difference. Another question we have. Uh, I think Deepak has given the answer for that. And then Aditya's question we have answered, right? Okay. And I think Gurvindra was answering the same question over here. Fine. All right. Huh. DK said, uh, how many labeled pictures should be trained? I didn't understand your question, DK. It depends upon the scenario, what we are trying to do. Let's suppose uh, if I'm trying to predict, uh, uh, let's say faces, right? Then I need lesser number of labels. For example, in faces, what do we look for? We look for eyebrows. So eyebrow is one label. Then eyes, eyes is another label. Nose, nose is third label. Lips, lips is fourth label. Then jaw structure is your fifth label. So based on these things, you predict. So it depends upon scenario to scenario. Okay. So as just a high level answer to your question would be that it depends on scenario to scenario. We can't say it depends. Okay. So it depends on the scenario what we are trying to do. Let's suppose, uh, so in one of our previous lectures, just to give you a hint, in one of our previous, in one of my previous lectures uh, in our class, we implemented a corona mass detector. Okay. We implemented corona mass detector. I, I will write it over here. Corona mass detector. So at that time, corona was uh, in its peak and we built a project similar to that. It was very easy. Okay. And there I had some pictures and those pictures I had given only two labels to them. Some pictures had a label called with mask. Some pictures had a label called without mask. Okay, and based on that, my machine learning model was detecting uh, just by seeing the image, whether that person in the image is with mask or without mask. So in my scenario over here, you can see DK that the images that I used only had one of the two labels assigned to them. If you are implementing some other uh, case study, you will need different amount of labels. In my case study, which is Corona mask detector, I had, I required only two labels with mask and without mask. Okay. In your case study, you would require different, depends from scenario to scenario. But I've given you a hint of what we did in one of my previous lectures over here. Okay. I hope the hint made sense. If there are more questions, please let me know. Okay. Fine. Uh, any other question? I think Aditya was giving answer maybe over here. Fine. If there are any other questions, please let me know. Fine. Coming to our main agenda for today. So guys, uh, first thing that we did was we completed basics of machine learning, right? And within basics, the first thing that we learned is definition of machine learning. We learned that machine learning is just a set of tools used for two purposes. First is either to get inferences from data. Second is to get predictions from data. How does it do that? How does it get inferences and predictions from data? It does that by using something called a machine learning model. So what is a machine learning model? It is a statistical representation of a real world process. Okay. And then we know that in order to make any machine learning model work, we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Now the columns of the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. Then we learn that machine learning models are of many types. Today we looked into two types. First was supervised machine learning models. Second was unsupervised machine learning models. Well, supervised machine learning models are those models wherein the data that we are using has features and target both. Unsupervised machine learning models are those models wherein the data that I'm using only has features. It does not have target. Okay. Then. We learned that supervised learning models are further of two types, classification and regression. In case of classification, the target column that I'm using has finite set of possibilities. In case of regression, the target column that I'm using has infinite set of possibilities. Okay, that was the basics that we learned. After that, we moved on to learn about one machine learning algorithm called KNN. So just to recap what we did in KNN, what did we do over here? First, we had some data. In that data, I had just plotted the data onto a graph. 
and I had five rows in the data over here. Out of them, four were labeled rows. One was unlabeled row. So for four labeled rows, I plotted four labeled points. For one unlabeled row, I plotted one unlabeled point. Fine. So I have just I just have my data and that data I have plotted onto the graph. Now let's go ahead and let's see how does this machine learning algorithm called K nearest neighbors work. Any machine learning algorithm is only used for two purposes. First is to get inferences. Second is to get insights. Let's say in this scenario I wanted. To, sorry, I repeat. I, I guess I gave the incorrect statement. I repeat my statement. Any machine learning algorithm is only used for two purposes. First is to get inferences. Second is to get predictions. Let's suppose in this scenario I wanted to get predictions. I want to predict that if in my company the age of an employee is 22 years, experience of that employee is one year, then what is the gender of that employee? So here I want to use my machine learning algorithm for prediction purposes. Let's see how would that work? What are the steps? There are four steps. First step is to choose number of neighbors. So suppose I have chosen number of neighbors equal to three. Second step is depending upon the number of neighbors, I will select that many closest labeled point with respect to the unlabeled data point. So over here, I have my unlabeled data point and with respect to that, I will select some closest labeled points. How many? Well, it depends upon number of neighbors. Since in the previous step, I selected three number of neighbors. That's why I will have three closest labeled data points and here I have them. Then third step is to make all of the selected labeled points to vote. Here I selected three labeled points, so I will have all of them to vote. Red points will vote red, blue points will vote blue. So your two votes will go to red, one vote will go to blue. Then fourth step is based on majority of the votes, assign a label to the unlabeled data point. Your majority of the votes have gone to red color, so I will assign the unlabeled data point a color of red. Red color means a target, means a gender value of female. So I'm predicting that this unlabeled row has a gender value of female or has a target value of female. So you are seeing how we are using the machine learning algorithm for doing prediction purposes. Any machine learning algorithm is used for only one of the two purpose. First is to either to get inferences. Second is either to get predictions. Here I used it to get predictions. I hope the theory made sense. Let's continue on this theory over here. Let's continue on this theory. Now, one question you might have over here that if in the first step I had selected different number of neighbors, then would my output have been different? Yes, it would have been different. For example, in this example, I selected number of neighbors equal to three. Let's say I take a different example. Okay, let's take this slide for example. Here I have this unlabeled data point in the middle. Okay, here I have this unlabeled data point in the middle. Let's say I am selecting five number of neighbors over here, or let's say three. I'm selecting three number of neighbors. If I'm selecting three number of neighbors, then I will make all of the selected label points to vote. Brown points will vote brown. Green points will vote green. Here, majority of the votes will go to brown. That's why the unlabeled data point will be labeled as brown. And you can see over here, the unlabeled data point in the middle has been labeled as brown. Let me take a different scenario. Let's suppose instead of number of neighbors equal to three, I take number of neighbors equal to five. So I will select five closest label data points. Now I will make all of the lab, uh, selected label points to vote. Brown points will vote brown. Green points will vote green. Your majority of the votes will go to green. That's why the unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as green. And now you can see it is labeled as green. Previously it was being labeled as brown. Now the same is being labeled as green. What changed? Basically the output changed. Why? Because we selected different number of neighbors. With number of neighbors equal to three, I was getting a completely different output. With number of neighbors equal to five, I'm getting a completely different output. So one important thing to keep in mind over here is that in KNN, there are four steps. And uh, once we looked at the four step, there are some things that will change. Okay, so things that will change. First, is number of neighbors. Okay, so number of neighbors has a lot of effect on the output. So if you select different number of neighbors, the output will be completely changed. Okay, so first is number of neighbors. Now, what is second thing? Guys, second thing is the distance formula. Okay, now in the working of KNN, 
we learned that depending upon the number of neighbors, we have to select that many closest label data points. How do you do that? We must apply some distance formula, right? So what are those distance formulas that are working in the background? Let's see those distance formulas. So KNN model uses three distance formulas. First is called a Manhattan distance formula. First is called Manhattan distance formula. Let's see that distance formula over here. So the formula of Manhattan is summation of summation of C2 minus C1 square. Okay. Now let's take an example wherein I have, uh, uh, let's say, a two dimensional graph. Okay. Or I have, let's say, only two features. I have only two features. Let's say they are X and Y. In that scenario, how will the Manhattan formula look like? Sorry, uh, the this one is slightly different. My mistake. I gave the incorrect uh, formula over here. Let me correct it. So the Manhattan formula is summation of modulus of C1, C2 minus C1. Okay. Summation of modulus of C2 minus C1. Let's use this formula, guys. And let's see how this Manhattan formula will look like if I have th just two features with me. First feature, let me call it X. Second feature, let me call it Y. In that scenario, the Manhattan formula will look something like this. It will be modulus of x2 minus x1 plus modulus of y2 minus y1. Okay, this is how the Manhattan formula will look like. What if I have three feature columns with me? In that case, how will the formula look like? Let's see. Let's suppose I have three feature columns. Let's say they, I will call it x, y, and z. In that scenario, how will the Manhattan formula will look like? It will look like this. Modulus of x2 minus x1 plus modulus of y2 minus y1 plus modulus of z2 minus z1. Okay. So this is how the Manhattan formula will look like in different scenarios. So this is our first formula, Manhattan formula. In total, there are three formulas out of which one formula I have shown to you, which is Manhattan formula. Now. Let's look at the second formula over here. Okay, we'll look at the second formula, which is Euclidean distance formula. So let's look at Euclidean distance formula. Let's see how that formula looks like. The formula is summation of summation of C2 minus C1, or, or I should say summation of uh, oh, sorry, I'll put this inside square root. Okay, square root of. Okay, inside square root, I will do summation of C2 minus C1 whole square. Okay, so this is how it will look like. Let me show, go ahead and let me show you how it would work. Suppose I have two feature columns. Let me call them X and Y. In that scenario, how to implement this Euclidean distance? Let's see. In that scenario, the Euclidean distance formula will look something like this. It will be square root of x2 minus x1 the whole square plus y2 minus y1 the whole square. However, if I have three feature columns, let's suppose I have x, y, and z. If I have three feature columns, then how will the same formula look like? Let's see. If I have X, Y, and Z, my three feature columns, then let's see how the same formula will look like. It will be something like this. Square root of X2 minus X1 the whole square plus Y2 minus Y1 the whole square plus Z2 minus Z1 the whole square. So you can see depending upon the number of feature columns, your formula will look uh, slightly lengthy. Okay. If it, if your uh, if you have if you are dealing with three feature columns the formula will be more lengthy if you are dealing with four feature columns it will be even more lengthy and so on so depending upon the number of feature columns your distance formula will work in a different way okay so our first distance formula was manhattan second second distance formula is euclidean okay second distance formula is euclidean now moving on to our third and last distance formula over here 
moving on to our third and last distance formula which is minkowski okay minkowski so let's see how that works so what is the formula for calculating minkowski distance so if you want to calculate minkowski distance it will be something like this so it is the whole raised to 1 by 2 inside i will have summation of uh over here i will just do c2 minus c1 the whole raised to p and actually over here outside i should raise it to 1 by p okay so this is how the formula looks like let me show you the implementation so suppose if you have two feature columns let me call them x and y okay let me call them x and y now let me show you how to use minkowski distance formula in this scenario it will look something like this here you see a important topic uh, important thing over here choosing value of p so let's say i'm choosing value of p equal to 2 okay let's say value of p is equal to 2 in that scenario let's see how to implement this formula let's say p equal to 2 in that scenario it will look something like this so this will be whole raised to 1 by 2 right 1 by p if p value is 2 then it will be whole raised to 1 by 2 whole raised to 1 by 3 means square root only right anything raised to 1 by 2 means square root only so square root of or if you are getting confused no issues let me not write square foot let me write it as 1 by 2 okay anything raised to 1 by 2 it's called square root only but fine let me raise it to 1 by 2 to keep it simpler for you guys then inside what i'll do summation of c2 minus c1 the whole raised to p so here i have two feature columns x and y so i will do x2 minus x1 whole raised to p p value is 2 so x2 minus x1 raised to 2 plus y2 minus y1 raised to 2 let's suppose if you have a uh, p equal to 3 in that scenario how will the formula change okay let's suppose p is equal to 3 in that scenario how will the formula change so you will do a change over here okay so instead of 1 by 2 now you will have 1 by 3 that is one change you will do and after that you will have changes over these two places so instead of raising these two terms by 2 i will raise them by 3 now because p value is 3 so i will raise them by 3 so i will raise them by 3 over here so this is how the formula will look like if you are dealing with two feature columns let's say if you are dealing with three feature columns then how does the formula look like let's see let's say they are x y and z in that scenario it will look something like this let's suppose the p value is the same p value is 3 how will the formula look like let's see that so here i will do something like this i will have uh let me mention it over here correctly in a correct color let me mention it over here and after that we'll move ahead so let's suppose if i have three feature columns x y and z in that scenario the formula will look something like this the whole i will raise it to 1 by 3 and inside i will have x2 minus x1 the whole raised to 3 plus y2 minus y1 the whole raised to 3 plus z2 minus z1 the whole raised to 3 So guys behind the scenes three distance formulas you can use either you can use manhattan distance formula or euclidean distance formula or minkowski distance formula okay you can use any one out of these three fine so just to recap what we have done so guys first we covered basics of machine learning after that we moved on to our first machine learning algorithm knn what are the steps of knn there are four steps first step was to choose number of neighbors right first step was to choose number of neighbors then what was the second step can anybody give me the second step in the chat so morugation p is a value that you decide okay and what is the correct value to decide in different scenario that we'll talk about ahead okay so morugation p is a value that you decide now in which scenario which value of p we should set that we'll talk about later okay
But Murugeshan, just to recap over here, first we covered basics of machine learning. After that, we moved on to our first machine learning algorithm called KNN. So we are seeing the steps of KNN. The first step is to choose number of neighbors. What is second step? Anybody with the second step, guys? Yes, Sri Devi has given all these steps. Perfect. So second step as per Sri Devi is depending upon the number of neighbors. Depending upon the number of neighbors. We will select. That many. Closest labeled points. We will select that many closest labeled points. OK, so depending upon the number of neighbors, we will select that many closest labeled points. Then what is the third step? Third step is we will make all. OK, third step is to select. Uh, sorry, I should restructure my second step over here. Second step, I will restructure. OK, in order to explain it in a correct manner. Second step, depending upon the number of neighbors, I will select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. With respect to the unlabeled data point. OK, that was the second step. Then third step also Sri Devi has correctly mentioned. Sri Devi has mentioned that third step is. That we will make. All of the selected labeled points to vote. All of the selected label points to vote. Red points will vote. Uh, so depending upon the uh, nature of the points, they will vote. OK, then. After that, fourth and last step is. Based on majority. Based on majority. OK, based on majority. We will assign a label. To the unlabeled data point. We will assign a label to the unlabeled data point. Fine. So these are the four steps. In these four steps, two things that will change the output. OK, first is number of neighbors. If you select different number of neighbors, the output that you receive at the end could be completely different. Second is. The choice of distance formula. Second is the choice of distance formula. So we learned about three distance formulas. First was Manhattan. Second was Euclidean. Third was Minkowski. OK, so these are the two things that will change the output. First is if you choose different number of neighbors, your output could change. Second is if you would use different distance formula, your output would change. So what is the correct number of neighbors to choose? What is the correct distance formula to choose? How to know that? OK, so in order. In order to find the correct settings. For your model. OK, so over here these two are nothing but settings. Number of neighbor is a setting. Distance formula is a setting. OK, so in order to arrive at the correct setting for your model. OK, we use something called hyperparameter tuning. We use something called hyperparameter tuning. OK, so in order to arrive at the correct settings for your model, settings are also known as parameters. So in order to arrive at the correct parameters for your model, we use something called hyperparameter tuning. OK, so let me go ahead and let me show you one such hyperparameter tuning approach, which is called grid search approach. OK, grid search approach. Let me show you how it would work. OK, so I will go ahead and I will try to show you how grid search approach will work. Let me show that to you. So let's suppose I have two settings for which I want to find the correct value. First is number of neighbors. First is number of neighbors. Second is distance formula. So let's see how to find the correct values for it using this technique called grid search hyperparameter tuning. OK, using this technique called grid search hyperparameter tuning. Let's see how it works. What are the steps? So first is to shortlist the values for the parameters. To shortlist values for the parameters. 
okay so here first i will go ahead and shortlist some values for the parameters over here let's suppose for number of neighbors i want to i have shortlisted some parameter values let's say they are uh, four and um, seven these are the values that i have shortlisted okay and let's say for uh, distance formula also i have shortlisted some values let's say uh, i have shortlisted some values like uh, manhattan then euclidean manhattan euclidean and minkowski okay so i have shortlisted the parameter values you might wonder how to shortlist parameter values is there a full proof way of that right now in the market there is no full proof way made okay uh, so one is either with experience you shortlist the best parameter values you might feel that on the previous data that you worked these parameter values worked correctly so you might feel that this with data that you are working with is also similar to the previous one so let's use the similar parameter values okay so one is purely based on experience second there are some um, statistical formulas that would help you to shortlist but they are not foolproof okay and uh, that is not even in our agenda for today so for now just remember that the first step in grid search approach is to shortlist values for the parameters and is there a foolproof approach to shortlist values for parameters no right now in the market there is no foolproof approach okay uh, there are some uh, approaches that will guide you okay to shortlist but still there is there are no foolproof approaches present in the market that will allow you to shortlist values for our parameters so for now let's do it manually okay for now let's do it manually let's say for number of neighbors i have shortlisted some values for distance formula i have shortlisted some values okay then second step in this grid search approach is to make models on all possible combinations of parameter values on all possible combinations of parameter values okay so i will go ahead and i will make models now on all possible combinations so let's go ahead and do that so i'll make models on all possible combinations of parameter values so the first model that i will make will be made with distance formula equal to manhattan and number of neighbors equal to 4 that will be my first model that i'll make after that i'll make my second model the second model will be made with distance formula equal to euclidean and number of neighbors equal to 4 then the third formula that i will make will be made with distance formula equal to minkowski and number of neighbors equal to 3 like this guys how many different models will i be able to make how many different models in total will i be able to make how many guys yes i will look at your doubts also for now just answer one thing guys over here just after completing my theory i will look at the doubts also dk has correctly given the answer that over here looking at the shortlisted values it seems that six possible models will be made right six possible models will be made fine then what we do is guys based on the uh, accuracy of that model let's say model 3 gave us the highest accuracy so what was the parameter values used in that highly accurate model the parameter value used in this model was distance formula equal to minkowski and number of neighbors equal to 4 that's how we know that okay these parameter values are good to use okay so this is called grid search approach okay so the this is called grid search approach so the way to find correct settings for your model is called hyperparameter tuning and we looked at one approach called grid search approach there are other approaches which are even worse than grid search approach okay that's why i'm not going into those approaches and those are not even in our agenda for today but over here just to give you a overview of how you go ahead that if there are some settings that you need to perform in your model for example in knn uh, algorithm there are two main settings that we need to perform first is choosing correct number of neighbors second is choosing correct distance formula how do we do that well number of ways 
uh, number of approaches we looked at one such way or one such approach which is grid search approach okay uh, why it is called grid search because you can see over here in the diagram that we have made we have almost made a grid uh, structure or a table like structure since we have made this grid like structure or a table like structure this is called grid approach okay fine and within this grid approach we are searching which is the correct value for the parameter that's why it is called grid search hyperparameter tuning approach because in this grid like structure we are searching for the best parameter value okay that's why it is called grid search hyperparameter tuning approach okay there are other approaches also which are even worse than grid search fine all right so this is the overview of how you should go ahead fine now let's go ahead guys and what we will do is now that we have understood the theory of our first machine learning algorithm let's see its implementation okay first i will show you the implementation of that using scikit-learn so let me go ahead and let me show you the implementation over here so what i will do is i will open up google collab and using google collab i will write some python code so let me show you the implementation what we have done up till now so first thing that we completed was basics of machine learning. Second thing that we moved on to was to learn about a machine learning algorithm called KNN, right? And we learned the theory of KNN. Now it's time to implement it. So let's go ahead. Let's see how to implement it over here. Okay. Now in scikit-learn, how would you implement? Now there are nine steps, guys, that you would use. First is you would make sure that your data should not have any missing values. Okay. Second is you will make sure that uh, you, you correctly extract your features and target. Third is you make sure that um, your features should have some rows and some columns. This might look like a very basic step, but I will show you ahead wherein this point is not satisfied and you will see the end result of it. Okay, what is the consequence of that? So it's very important to satisfy this point. It look, it might look like a very basic point, but it's very important. I'll show you why. Fine. Then the fourth step, guys, is to make sure that your features are of numeric nature. Okay, if they are not of numeric, you will convert them to numeric. Then the fifth step, is to split the data into two parts. First is training and second is testing. Then the sixth step is to make sure that your features are on the same scale. If they are not on the same scale, you would convert them to the same scale. Then seventh step is to train the model on the training data set. Train the model on the training data set. And eighth step is to test the model on the testing data set. Test the model on the testing data set. These are the eight steps that you would apply in order to implement any supervised learning algorithm in scikit-learn library. Okay. So in scikit-learn library, you have these eight steps, which are slightly tedious. But you will see later on, we'll use a different library called PyCaret, and you will see with PyCaret how your implementation becomes simpler. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead for now. First step, data should not have missing values. First, let me get my data. I will just upload my data onto Google Collab over here. One second, it is still connecting. And now that it has connected, let me upload some data. So I have some data over here. Let me upload it. Here we go. Fine. And now this data is in the form of a CSV file. From that CSV file, I will just go ahead, read the data in that CSV file and convert it to a data frame. Okay. There is a, a type of value in Python called a data frame. So I'm just converting it to a data frame over here. Fine. And from where do I want to uh, read the CSV file? The name of it is iris.csv. Fine. So let's go ahead. Let me mention the name over here. 
fine and i have obtained my data one second it says no such name called iris yes uh, here in the uploaded file i was capital so let me make it capital over here after doing that correction fine we have obtained our data and i have read the data in the csv file and converted it to a data frame you can see the type of it it is a data frame over here you can see it is a data frame all right fine then now i have obtained my data now let's implement these steps first step data should not have any missing values so let's go ahead and let's check if my data has missing values or not on checking i observe that my data does not have any missing values so that's good news if your data has missing values you would need to treat it okay how to treat it that's beyond the scope of our webinar but once our webinar ends if you have a doubt on it i will show you how to treat that also fine second step uh, how to extract feature second step is to extract features and target now let's suppose from this data basically what is this data all about so basically there was some scientist who recorded information about 150 iris flowers okay in the jungle there were 150 iris flowers and they recorded their sepal length they recorded the sepal width of the flower they recorded the petal length petal width of the flower and the species of that iris flower there are only three species of iris flower either it is called iris setosa or it is called iris virginica or it is called iris versicolor there are only three species okay now suppose guys this species column is my target column we know in this species column there are only three possibilities either iris setosa or iris virginica or iris versicolor so if in my target column i have only three possibilities that means in my target column i have finite set of possibilities and if in my target column i have finite set of possibilities we know that we can build a classification model over here fine and we have known about knn which is used for classification purposes so it's perfect for this data fine let's go ahead now going ahead let's move ahead guys over here first step is done my data does not have any missing values second step extract features and target my target column is this species column so let me extract it over here so species column i'll just go ahead extract it here we go and i have extracted my target column rest of the column apart from target will be my potential feature columns so rest of the columns apart from target over here will be my potential feature columns okay so rest of the column apart from target are my potential feature columns now have a look at your potential feature columns is there any column that you feel is not worthy of becoming a feature any column guys think okay, i'll come to that uh, you are saying any you said accuracy you are saying how to implement that theory right how to implement grid search approach is that what you are asking if that is what you are asking then yes that will be shown okay because in grid search approach i use the term accuracy right so i'm wondering how to implement the same theory that we saw if you are asking that then yes that will be shown fine uh, coming to a main point guys here i was extracting my features and target i did extract my target now i was trying to extract my features so over here i have my potential feature columns any column over here that you feel is not worthy of becoming a feature column any column guys id right aditya has given the correct answer id it's not worthy of becoming a feature column it will not help me to predict target which is my species id will not help me to predict species of a flower so id column i will drop fine here i am doing feature selection manually but in the industry you do it using some approach okay here since this is our first webinar i am doing it manually fine let's go ahead now with this what i have done is i have correctly extracted my features and target okay and and, and i am happy with my target column i am happy with my feature columns then third step features should have some rows and some amount of columns fine so let's check whether they do have some rows and some columns or not on checking we observe that the features do have some rows and some columns so that's good then fourth step features should be of numeric nature so let's go ahead and check if they are of numeric nature over here 
you will observe that all the feature columns are of numeric nature. If you are familiar with Python, you would be uh, understanding this data type called float. Float is basically a numeric type only, right? You can even check it from over here. All your feature columns are of numeric nature. Sepal length column has numeric values. Sepal width column has numeric values. Petal length column has numeric values. Petal width column has numeric values. All of the four feature columns are of numeric nature. So that's good. You might be wondering what if they are not of numeric nature? You will convert them to numeric then. Okay. But over here, luckily, we do not have to do that. So that's fine. Then fifth step, split the data into two parts, training and testing. So let's go ahead. Let's split the data over here into two parts, training and testing. Okay. So what I would do is from the Escalon folder, there is a file called model selection. From that file, I will import this function called train test split. Okay, fine. And I'll call this function. To this function, I'll pass my first positional argument, which is my features, referenced by a variable x. Then I'll pass my target, referenced by a variable y. Then I'll use the test size keyword argument. And to it, let's say I'm passing a value of 0 0.2. That means 20% of the overall data will go for testing and the remaining 80% will go for training. Now remember that the number of, that the rows selected in training and testing will be selected randomly. It's not like the first 20% of rows will be going in testing. No, 20% of the rows will be going yes, but the selection of rows will be random. Let's have 10 rows, okay? And 20% of it I want to go into testing. 20% of 10 is 2. So I want 2 rows to go into testing. So 2 rows will go into testing, but the selection of those 2 rows will be random. So selection of rows into training and testing is random. Remember that. Fine. And after that, with this, what will happen is I will get 4 things. First, my features will be divided into 2 parts. I will get x train and x test. Then my target will be divided into 2 parts. So I'll get y train and y test. So I'll get four things in total. First is fe uh, features of my training data set. Second features of my testing data set. After that target of my training data set and fourth target of my testing data set. Okay, let's go ahead. With this step, I've implemented step five over here. Now in step five, we do a lot more things, but just to keep it simple, I'm not going up to that since we have limited time and it's beyond our scope of webinar. Okay, but remember that over here, what we are doing is bare minimum implementation. Okay, ideally, your implementation will have a lot of other things also uh, to make your implementation a lot more better. But here we are doing bare minimum. Okay, then sixth step features should be on the same scale. What do I mean on the same scale over here? So let's take an example. Suppose we have third standard students and 10 standard students. And let's say uh, I have some third standard students over here uh, and their heights are, let's say, uh, 2.9 feet. Then another student had a height of 3.2 feet. Then one had a height of 2.6 feet and so on. Okay. After that, we have 10 standard students. Their height is 5.1 feet. Then another student has a height of 4.9 feet and so on. Now, if anybody asks us, are 10 standard students and third standard students on the same level in terms of their height? No, right? They are not on the same level. How do we know that? In your mind, you would, uh, you would have basically calculated the average height of third standard students and you would have calculated the average height of 10 standard students. And in your mind, you would have compared the average and you would have arrived at the conclusion that no, Third standard students are not on the same level as 10 standard students in terms of their height, right? So how are you comparing whether they are on the same level or not by comparing the average values, right? So that's exactly what we do with features. When I say whether they are on the same scale or not, I mean to say that whether they are on the same level or not. And how to do that? By comparing the average value of the features. Okay, so let's compare average value of the features. Another word for average is mean. So let's compare mean value of features or average value of features. Here by comparing, we'll see is there too much of a difference or 
very less difference here over here it seems there might be too much of a difference some people would argue that we have very less difference how to know whether there is too much of a difference or very less difference we do that by using a approach called hypothesis testing okay called hypothesis testing and with hypothesis testing what we do is we compare mean values of the features to see if there is too much of difference with between the mean values or if there is less difference between the mean values okay here i am not going into that topic uh, because it's out, outside the scope of our uh, webinar and that topic itself will take 2 hours of time okay so i'm not going into that but i'm going i am giving you the output directly that if you apply hypothesis testing over here you will see that the mean value of the feature uh, the difference is not too much okay that is the output that you will get i'm directly giving you the output over here since we do not have time to understand the theory because the theory of this itself takes 2 hours or more okay so i'm directly giving you the output that if you implement this you would uh, receive output saying that the mean value of the feature columns is not very uh, uh, you know different than one another so we we could argue that okay they are almost on the same scale or almost on the same level so if they are almost on the same level then there is no need to convert them to the same scale if they were not on the same scale we would make sure that they are converted to the same scale but here i'm directly giving you the output that if you apply hypothesis testing over here okay you will arrive at the output that they are almost at the same scale so no need to worry fine i'm not going into the theory of that because that's lengthy and outside the scope of our webinar so moving ahead seven step seven step train the model on the training data set so let's go ahead let's train the model over here on the training data set and what we would do is from the sql on folder there is a file called neighbors from that file okay from that file i will import this class called k neighbors classifier there is a class called k neighbors classifier let me go ahead and let me import the class after this class is imported let me call it and over here while calling the class the model will be built remember the model will not be trained it is just that it will be built okay so here let me pass the setting values so first thing that i will pass is the number of neighbors right that is the setting that i need to pass so for now let me pass it manually okay after that i will show you how to arrive at the correct value for these settings first let me pass it manually let's suppose number of neighbors is 5 second the distance formula to use so let's suppose the distance formula is let's say minkowski okay minkowski okay you can choose manhattan also depending upon your uh, uh, scenario okay you can use different different uh, uh you can say distance formulas here let me apply something called min count scheme min count scheme okay then within min count scheme there is another thing which is p value right so let me set a value for p let me set it to 2 here i'm just setting manual values let's see whether manual values work if they do not work then i will show you that how to arrive at the correct setting values using the approach that we saw Fine. and with this my model will be built okay and once the model is built what i would do over here is i would just go ahead and uh, train the model because my seventh step is to train the model on the training data set out of the four things that we got over here in step five how many things are coming under my training data set you will observe that x train and y train come under your training data set so i'll pass x train and y train both with this my seventh step is done now that my seventh step is done guys i will move on to my eighth step my eighth step is to test the model on the testing data set so let's go ahead let's test the model on the testing data set so for that i will use the score method and in the fifth step out of the four things that we received how many things belong to the testing data set x test and y test belong to the testing data set so i will pass them over here inside the score method with this i will get a accuracy value and accuracy value is always between 0 to 1 
for a model to be acceptable, the accuracy should at least be greater than 0 0.7. And here it is greater than 0 0.7. Here it is in fact 0 0.96. That means our model is 96% accurate on the testing data set. Okay, on the testing data set, it is 96% accurate. Fine, we feel that my model is acceptable. So now we can use the model for some purpose. A model is only used for one of the two purposes. First is either to make inferences. Second is either to make predictions. Here, let me use it to make predictions. Okay, let me go ahead and do that. And what I would do is before doing predictions, guys, two things to take care of. Before doing predictions, before doing predictions, two things to take care of. First, the data on which you want to predict. should go through the same changes as your features. And second, the number of feature columns, or I should say the number of columns in the data that you want to predict should match should match with the number of feature columns should match with the number of feature columns okay so these are the two things to take care of did we do any changes on my features no so that's why on the data that i want to predict i will not do changes then the number of columns on the data that i want to predict should be same as the number of feature columns how many number of feature columns i have four right so that's why in the data that I want to predict, I will also have four columns. So let me have four columns over. Let me make my own data. Okay. So in the feature, in case of features, I have four columns, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width. So in this data also, I will have exactly those four. For sepal length, let me pass a value, let's say two. Then for second feature column, which is sepal width, let me pass a value, which is, let's say, three point whatever you could pass whatever value does not matter let's say for your third column i am passing a value let's say two and let's say for your fourth column i am passing a value let's say five okay does not matter you can pass anything now let's go ahead and let's predict on this data before that make sure that these two points are satisfied in our case they are satisfied that's why we'll just go ahead and predict on this model for that i'll use this predict method and to it i'll just pass this data in this data guys i just have one row that's why i will my model will only predict one target value and you can see it predicts one target value over here it says that the species of this flower is versicolor okay and we know that there are only three species possible either iris setosa or iris virginica or iris versicolor here it says that it is versicolor and it is correct because uh, if you have knowledge of plants, you would observe that in versicolor species, their petal width is a lot more. Okay. So that is the characteristic of a versicolor species. That is sepal width is a lot more. Okay. And here we deliberately increase the, sorry, not sepal width. I mean petal width. The petal width of versicolor species is a lot more. And that's exactly what my model also thinks. Okay. Comparatively, you can see out of the all the values, your I had increased the petal width value because I wanted to check that yes, in reality, a versicolor species has a long petal width. Is that exactly what my model also believes? It does believe that. Fine. And over here, you can see I have implemented my model. Now here, I have implemented a model using bare minimum things. There are a lot more things you can improve. So there are a lot more things you can improve. Here, you can apply the uh, grid search hyperparameter tuning approach because to find settings over here i did not use grid search hyperparameter tuning i just applied settings manually i did not apply the approach okay but what if you want to apply it then what to do let's see that okay up till here guys i have shown you the bare minimum implementation did the bare minimum implementation make sense up till here making sense guys Hardy, I will show you. 
yes okay fine now let's go ahead guys okay and dk is asking that for grid search hyperparameter tuning we have seen the theory but i had told that i will show you implementation also so let's see implementation but before that i will show you one more theory which is that of cross validation and uh, uh, together we'll implement both of them okay so let me explain to you cross validation now dk a question for you buddy suppose you own a company okay you own a company and you want to hire the best programmer let's say the best python programmer the best python programmer you own a company and you want to hire the best python programmer so let's say a candidate came to you and he told you that uh, he also showed you the result that he got so he had attempted one uh, python test and in that test he got 20 out of 20 so let's say he got 100% so in that test he was 100% accurate okay he was 100% accurate that guy attempted one test and in that test he was 100% accurate so dk will you hire that candidate just based on this just based on this one test will you hire him what do you think dk what would you do normally if you are the owner of a company and you want to hire the best python programmer so let's say a python programmer came to you and he told you that okay i have attempted this test and in that test he got 20 out of 20 that means he was 100 percent accurate so just based on this one test will you hire what do you think gurvindra will you do that just based on this one test just based on this no right maybe that test was easy do you know the complexity of that test maybe that test was easy possible right and that's why he got 100 out of 100 so just based on one test we should not arrive at a conclusions so what should we do can i say gurvindra we should perform more tests to be more sure of the candidate correct right if i am not sure of the candidate just based on one test i should perform more tests on the candidate that's exactly what we do on our model also okay that's exactly what we do on our model also and that's exactly what was being done to you guys as students when you were in schools see previously uh, in uh, when i was uh, in school time right at least up till second to third standard the education module was very different there we just had a semester exam in our school we just had one semester uh, we just had semester exam that's all after that they realized that judging students based on semester exam alone is not correct that's why they introduced something called sessionals or in some states they are also called unit test right i don't know whether you are in that era or not where you did not have to go through unit test but i was in that era where uh, i did not go through unit test okay at least for uh, in some of the standards i did not have unit test then the entire education system changed they realized that just based on sessionals you can't uh, judge the student that's why they uh, introduced something called sessionals or unit test which are these small small tests that you need to perform and that's exactly what we do on our model also on our model also will make the model go through unit test or sessionals okay so just like in our education system we have two types of test semester exam and unit test right in some states it's also called sessionals in maharashtra it is called unit test i guess in some state like madhya pradesh it could be called sessionals depends okay but the idea is the same okay so just like we had to go through different kinds of tests one is semester exam second is unit test similarly we will make our model also go through do, go through that first is semester and second is unit test now gurvindra a question for you buddy ideally to judge a candidate can i say the question that should come in unit test should be different than the question that should come in semester exam correct the question that should come in unit test should be different than the sessional uh, than the question that should come in semester exam it should be different right because if the it is the same let's say you got a question in unit test 
and same question comes in semester exam it will be easy for you that way you are not uh, judging the knowledge of a candidate right so in order to effectively judge knowledge of a candidate the question that should come in sessional exam or unit test exam should be different than what you get in semester same with the case of model in case of model also the rows that you pass in semester should be different than the rows that you pass in unit test okay so in case of model the rows that you pass for semester exam should be different than the rows that you pass for unit test okay so just like uh, gurvendra agreed that if we are talking about our normal school system in order to effectively judge a student the question that is asked in a unit test should be different than the question asked in a semester exam similarly in case of model the rows that you pass for semester exam should be different than the rows that you pass for unit test okay fine how to do it let's see so let's go ahead and let's see how to do it guys we'll go ahead and now we'll see how to do it we'll just stretch it just for 10 uh, 15 minutes okay just 15 minutes more and after that we'll end fine just 15 minutes more guys i'll not take much of your time all right let's go ahead so what we do is obviously we know our entire data is split into two parts training and testing so we'll have that like we normally do training and testing our data will split it into two parts training and testing so what we do in case of machine learning model guys is that the testing data set we reserve it for semester exam okay we reserve it for semester exam so guys this code that we performed wherein on my testing data set i checked the accuracy score this is the score of my semester exam okay this is the score of my semester exam then you might wonder what about unit test let's see so guys for unit test you only focus on your training data set okay for unit test you only take rows from your training data set okay so let's see how that works okay so i will take my training data set and i would divide it into some number of parts those parts are known as folds those parts are known as folds let's say i divide it into three folds that means three parts okay then what would happen is in the first iteration okay in the first iteration uh, we could have the let's say i'm dividing into three parts okay in the first iteration i could have the last part in testing and the remaining two parts in training okay in the second iteration again i will divide into same three parts but now the sec second last will be taken into testing the remaining two into training and then in the third iteration what will happen is again same three parts but now the third last part will be selected as testing and the remaining two into training so like this what will happen is i will be performing iterations depending upon the number of folds i have selected if i have selected three folds i will do three iterations if i have selected four folds i will do four iterations and so on okay in the first iteration over here the last part got selected into testing remaining into training in the second iteration second last part got selected into testing remaining into training in the third iteration the third last part got selected into testing the remaining into training okay fine so gurvendra over here i have three iterations so how many testing scores will i get you tell me buddy how many testing scores will i get ha huh, gurvendra that will see three right three testing scores so can i say guy uh, gurvendra it's similar to three unit tests that we have in our schools right it's similar to three unit tests that we get in schools yes that's exactly what you do on our model also so gurvendra how to select the number of folds so can i say gurvendra the if depending upon the number of folds you are performing that many unit test if i select three folds i am doing three unit test if i am doing four folds i am doing four unit test the more you do the better it is but what is the drawback of selecting a very high number 
the time will increase computation will increase okay but in general the more you do the better it is for you the more folds you select the more unit tests you will be able to do okay the more folds you select the more unit tests you you will be able to do and uh, ideally you should select a higher number something like 4 5 you might select something like 10 also but what is the drawback that as you keep on increasing the number of folds the time taken will increase the computation done will be increased and this is fine i am doing the computation on my laptop so there is no cost if you are doing it on a cloud system with each computation your cost will increase okay so you have to take care of that also so normally in the industry we stop after 4 or 5 iterations we never go beyond 10 iterations or never go beyond 10 folds but if you want to go beyond 10 folds up to you okay so to answer your question what is the number of folds to select it depends upon you the more you select the better it is but two things to consider first is time second is computation okay keeping these two things in mind you have to arrive at the best value okay dk okay uh, dk let me again explain to you dk in each iteration only one will be selected in testing okay and the remaining will be selected in training in each iteration that's how i'll be able to do these unit test okay that's how i'll be able to do this unit test in each iteration always one will go into testing okay and the remaining will go into training so for example if i'm doing four folds over here if i'm doing four folds then dk i will divide the data into how many parts four parts right if i'm doing four folds let's say then i'll divide it into four parts let's say i'm doing four folds then i will divide it into four parts okay what will happen in the first iteration the last part will go into testing then in the second iteration the second last part will go into testing then in the third iteration the third last part will go into testing and in the fourth iteration the fourth last part will go into testing like this it will happen okay in the fourth iteration the fourth last part will go into testing so in each iteration one part will go into testing okay the remaining parts will go into training for example in this iteration first three parts went into training the last part went into testing in this iteration first second and fourth part went into training third part went into testing in this iteration first third and fourth went into training second went into testing and so on so in each iteration one part will go into testing so here you tell me dk your one went into testing so one unit test your second went into testing second unit test your third went into testing third unit test your fourth went into testing fourth unit test so when i selected four folds i am able to perform four unit test similarly if you select five folds you will be able to perform five unit test and so on okay so the guys this is the theory of something called cross validation okay and this is called k fold cross validation k fold cross validation wherein the value of k depends upon you you can select 3 4 anything okay the more you select the better it is for you it's just that with more number of folds the time increases and computation increases okay fine we have seen the theory of this let's see how to apply this over here so in scikit learn normally how would you apply this let's see that okay so in scikit learn guys if 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 ever you want to apply this what would you do okay what is the general uh, coding approach i should say that you should apply let's see so for that in order to apply both these approaches which is grid search approach k fold cross validation approach there is a class that will help me okay so let me go down let me import that class so i'll say from sklearn dot uh, your i think there is a file called model selection so from sklearn folder there is a model selection file from it i will import this class called grid search cv okay from it i will just import this class over here called grid search cv let me go down let me import it after that i will go down call it so let me call okay let me go ahead and let me call over here and here what i will do is uh, i need to pass some things to it 
to be uh, precise i need to pass three main things first is the model on which i want to apply so let me pass the model on which i want to apply second is in order to apply grid search approach we need to shortlist some parameter values right so what are those parameter values so you will need to pass it inside of a dictionary okay so there were two parameter values first is number of neighbors okay so let me pass some let me shortlist some values let's say 4 and 7 and second is uh, the distance formula okay so let me pass something like uh, let's say i'm shortlisting uh, euclidean and minkowski minkowski okay then there was one more if you remember which was that p value right so let me set a value to that also so let me shortlist i can say 2 4 and so on fine with this i can i will i am shortlisting some values here i have shortlisted two two values each you can select uh, shortlist any number of values for one parameter you could shortlist 10 for another you could shortlist 20 and so on depends fine so first is i pass the model on which i want to apply this uh, these techniques second for grid search hyperparameter tuning what is the shortlisted parameter values then for k fold cross validation how many folds do you want to perform so for that there is a parameter called cv uh, which will take the value of folds so let's say i want to perform three fold cross validation fine with this a new model will be made and then rest of the steps i'll keep it the same okay rest of the steps i'll keep it the same over here let me go ahead let me run the code again from start okay your what did i get warning this is just a warning it's not a error okay because at the end i am get getting the output it's not a error over here fine so this is just a warning which is fine we do not care about warnings our code worked over here i have applied both grid search cross validation and hyperparameter tuning now let's go ahead and let's see the output of it okay we'll go ahead and we'll see the output of it so i want to find out that what is the best uh, parameter values that i have obtained okay because with grid search i do obtain the best parameter values so let's see what is the best parameter values so there is a attribute over here called best params which will give me the best parameter values so it says the best parameter values after applying both the techniques grid search and cross validation is this one for metric it is minkowski for number of neighbors it is 4 and for p value it is 2 so now i know that okay this is the best model that we can build so i will go ahead and build the model number of neighbors will be 4 metric will be minkowski p value is 2 i'll go ahead and build the model okay and here guys if you are worrying uh, uh, want to get the unit test score right how to get the unit test scores let's see so guys how many unit tests did we perform we performed three unit tests right so if you want to get the unit test scores how to get it so in order to get the unit test score here you will use this attribute called best underscore score underscore and over here does it one second i'll have to run the code from start let me run the code from start over here yes and this is the average value of those unit test so it performed three unit test and out of those three unit test it gave the average value okay so this is the average value of unit test once we get the average value of unit test then what is the semester score let's see the semester score over here again i will run the code from start okay let me go ahead let me run the code from start over here this is occurring because i have used same variables many at many many places but that's fine it's not fitted yes okay i've built the model but not fitted and we need to fit it fine let's go ahead and do that and with this now i have obtained my semester score also and this is my semester score so you can see the average unit test score and the average semester score both are good right 
and you can see this is the implementation of grid search hyperparameter tuning and k-fold cross-validation. Here I did not go into much depth of it because we have limited time. Okay, but this is the um, overview of how you can implement. Now this you are doing using sklearn. Let this you are doing using sklearn, guys. There is another library. There is another library called pycaret with which all of this implementation becomes a lot more simple and you will see how. So let me go ahead. Let me first install that library because it's not automatically available in uh, Google Colab. So I will install that library over here. OK, sklearn, pandas, all of it is automatically available in Google Colab, but this one is not, so I will have to install. Fine, and after that, I will show you how using uh, pycaret your implementation becomes a lot more simple. OK, just five minutes after that will end. I'll just install it over here. Just five minutes. We are just waiting for the successful implementation uh, installation to be over. It is still installing fine and now it's over. Now let me upload the data over here again since this is a different file that I'm working in. Uh, again, same data. OK, and with PyCaret, you will see how easy it is. OK, you will see how easy it is. So first, let me go ahead and let me get that data over here in the form of a data frame. I will go ahead and get that data over here in the form of a data frame, just like I did earlier. And here we go. Fine. Now, since on this data, I want to implement a classification model. Fine. So let me go ahead and let me get all the reusable codes that could be useful over here. So what I will do is from PyCaret folder, there is a file called classification. And from that, I will import all the reusable codes. So I'm putting this star symbol with which I'll get all the reusable codes. Fine. And now let's go ahead. Let's see the steps. So guys, first is to use this. Uh, you can say function called setup function. Here you need to pass many things. First, you need to pass the data on which you want to work. Second, you need to pass the target column on that data. So in this case, my target column was species column. OK, third, you can pass your missing value strategy. Fourth, you can pass the number of cross validations uh, you, or the number of um, K fold cross validation you want to perform and all of that. So all of those settings you need to specify over here. First is your data. Second is target value in that data. Third is the missing value strategy. Luckily in this data, we do not have missing values, so no issues. Fourth is how many number of class validations you want to perform. OK, and uh, those are the important things which you need to pass. And fifth is that if your feature columns in the data are not on the same scale, then in order to convert it onto the same scale, what is the strategy that you need to apply? Fine. So five main things. First, your data. Second, your target column in that data. These two things are necessary. OK. Then remaining three things are optional. What are those remaining three things? So third is your missing value strategy. Fourth is your uh, K-fold cross validation number. And fifth is your uh, uh, pre-processing strategy. So if your features are not on the same scale, how will you process them to the same scale? Fine. Uh, those remaining things are not necessary. These two things are necessary. So I'll go ahead and mention them over here. Fine. And with this, what what will happen is I will be able to uh, basically you can say set up my uh, a pie carrot library. OK, my pie carrot library will be set up. Fine. And now that it is set up, guys, first thing we have done, first step, set up pie carrot library. Second, build a model. So let's go ahead. Let's build a model over here. In order to build a model, guys, all you have to do is use this function over here called create underscore model. Create underscore model. And here I want to build a model called KNN. So I will go ahead and apply KNN. Fine. And my KNN model will be built. Okay. Let me save that built model with a variable over here. 
it will be built, it will be trained. OK, by default, it is doing 10 fold cross validation over here. Why? Because during setup, we did not specify a value, so it is taking default value of 10 fold. Fine. And over here, it has performed it. It has also performed hyperparameter tuning. OK, after every iteration, you can see what is the parameter value. So in first iteration, you can see the accuracy value in second accuracy value, third accuracy value. So here it has applied grid search hyperparameter tuning, K fold cross validation both. OK, you can see how easily it has applied up till now only two things. First setup function, second create model function. Third, just and third and last code that you will apply over here is you will call this function called predict underscore model predict underscore model and here you will say that I want to predict on this model that I have made. So it will go ahead and predict it for you. Let me go ahead and let me run this and it will predict it for you and you can see it has predicted for the entire data. It has predicted for the first row that the uh, target value is this for the second row for the third row for the fourth row and so on. Apart from that it has also given the score as to what it believes is the probability of obtaining that target value. How do you obtain? Because in KNN we know, right? The uh, target value is arrived at by voting. So if there are total three points and let's say out of those, all three points are voting versicolor. So the probability will be equal to one. Let's say out of those three, only two believe to be versicolor. Then the probability will be 0 0.66 and so on. So you can see we just had to use three lines of code and all the things it has done automatically. First is call setup function. Second is call create model function. Third is call predict model function. That's all. You can see how easy it is to use PyCaret library over here. And with PyCaret library, a lot of your implementation is automated, which was not possible in sklearn. So sklearn is predated now. Okay, in the industry now, very less companies use sklearn. OK, so going forward, if you want to uh, automate your implementation, make sure you use PyCaret library. You can see just by writing three lines of code, everything was done. Have a look at sklearn. What did I have to do here? Let's see from start. Have a look at the amount of lines I had to write. Have a look at the amount of coding lines I had to write. Whereas with PyCaret, just three lines. First call setup function, second call create model function, Third called predict model function. Fine. So our goal of this webinar was to introduce you to machine learning. Just show you how it was being implemented earlier with sklearn library because uh, here we use sklearn library because online you, uh, whenever you see tutorials of sklearn you will be um, seeing examples of sklearn a lot. After that. Uh, we introduced PyCaret library and we saw how with PyCaret a lot of your implementation could be automated. So that is it for today, guys. Uh, our webinar was from 2 to 6. From 6.30, I have another session. So I'll have to drop off. Uh, for more training, uh, you can contact Chaitali. So I will hand it over to Chaitali. Chaitali, you can take over. Okay. And that's it for today, guys. I hope the webinar was of some use to you. Yeah, Chaitali, go ahead. Uh, and it will you are not audible. Hello? Yeah. This back form is in the chat box. Make sure you submit the feedback form.